Hey everyone, this is Harkin Labs Gaming, and uh, kind of here with a tutorial today. So, this is a uh, automation. It's a game where you can build different cars, and uh, basically, you can design the car from the ground up. And uh, I'm going to show you guys how to basically build a good car. So uh, first things first, uh, there's a lot of different cars to choose from in a bunch of different eras you can have. Like you can go in like mid-2000s, or like the early 2010s, and then you can go all the way back to 1940-something. Yeah, 1946. So um, today I guess I'm going to show how to build basically... Let's go with 1980s, because a lot of the cars on the, uh, like that you can download off the forums and uh, repository for BeamNG, there are a lot of 80s cars. And a lot of them I've seen, they, they have a little bit of weird issues with them. So, say I'm going to build, let's just say, 1985 sedan. 106-inch wheelbase, that's mid-size car maybe a little bit on the larger side for the 1980s and the uh, first thing you want to do is you want to select material and the material typically found in these cars is either corrosion resistant, resistant steel for like higher end cars or just normal steel steel for like budget cars and you know a little bit in between I'm gonna pick corrosion resistant and in the 80s they were starting to get like unibody cars and no one has space frames. Space frames are only uh, race cars. And light truck, that doesn't apply here. Because that's that's for like, if you have like a cab of a truck and then you want to have a bed on it, then you have this because it, it basically puts a frame on the back of the vehicle. I'm going to go with the unibody because that's pretty common at the time. For this, you don't want to pick steel because steel really does not like hold up for chassis you want galvanized steel at least front traverse is like a front wheel drive application front longitudinal is for rear wheel drive and then rear engine that's a whole nother thing so well, let's make a rear wheel drive sedan the typical car is McPherson in the front and um, in the rear it sort of depends on the car for rear-wheel drive in the 80s, it was pretty common to have solid axle with coils and springs, or leaf springs. But they also sometimes could have semi-trailing arms for a uh, like a higher-end car, like a BMW. And like little sports cars, they'd have double wish on all around. And sometimes it's first in the front. So it just depends on the car. So I'm going to go with coil, because it's cheap and it's easy. Now for engines, this is going to be an American car, so big V8. 60 degree engines are only really for V6s, so um, I wouldn't really choose that for a V8. I've seen a lot of V8s that are 60 degrees in automation. It's typically not the case in real life. Normally, American older engines are cast iron, push rod, and... Um, like cast iron head material. Normally they don't have overhead cam until like the mid 90s. <clears throat> and normally these in like a normal car, they're always cast iron unless they're they have a uh, forced induction like a turbocharger or a supercharger. Then you start to see heavy duty cast and forged car uh, forged internals for the cars. No, there are. Uh, cast iron flat planes that basically change the firing order of the cylinders and that's pretty useful if like um, I know like Crown Vicks and basically Fords with like the Mustang GT and the Crown Victorias and stuff like that with the 4.6 they I'm pretty sure were uh, cast iron or not cast iron but uh, flat plane V8s but we're just gonna use normal oh I forgot to change the engine size so let's make a 315 cubic inch V8. And let's make it completely square. 
there, 315 cubic inches. I use cubic inches because it's America. Um, we're going to do that. Compression, typically, it starts off at like 7.5 for larger engines, and for smaller engines, typically a little bit higher. Well, actually, more of for older Older cars is pretty low, and then in more modern vehicles, you have to, you, that, that's basically, you have to just tune this until you get the car dialed in right. Cam profile, we can just leave it at that for now. Naturally aspirated is fine for this, because that would be unrealistic if it wasn't. And um, a lot of people uh, do this and put mechanical fuel injection, which is not even remotely realistic because mechanical fuel injection really was only used on a um, like I think in the 60s they had it on a Corvette and that was pretty cool but it's basically it's it's race technology it, it, this would not be on a production car in reality and in the 80s they'd probably use single point in America and for more high-end cars and some imports used multi-point but it was relatively new technology at the time and it was cheaper to make single points, so that's what American manufacturers used. I believe up until 1991, um, the Chevy 350 used single point EFI, which was a little bit outdated at that time, but it was still acceptable because it was only used in like Camaros and um, Suburbans and huge vehicles like that. Then they switched over to multi point. Uh, intake is normally standard, like on a like a higher, like faster car, like a sports car, maybe performance intake is okay, but normally I just leave it as standard. Um, fuel type, you always want to have a regular for like average cars, but premium and super for like turbocharged, and that's basically the only ap application. You want to switch from um, regular... Uh, regular leaded to regular basically in the mid 70s fuel mixture here it's okay but if we want more fuel efficiency we can tune it so that way it's leaner um, let's put the rpm at 5000 because it's a rather big engine um, we can leave the timing alone for right now uh, in the 80s and Basically, past the 70s, uh, they stopped using like cast log headers. But I mean, they they still did, but like they were much better than that. That's that's not. This is just not right. This is more of an acceptable thing, but really, only performance cars and high-end cars would use tubular exhaust. So tend to keep away from those. For the catalytic converter. It's mid 80s, so probably three way was just probably coming out at the time. Um, normally, I leave that alone, so no, no first muffler and the second muffler I have reverse flow. And uh, it seems like we have a slight knock, and that's because octane is too too high. So I'll fix that and be right back. Actually, I'll do that with you guys. So, basically, to get rid of the octane issue, because we have this car set to 86 AKI, which basically means that we need to get that down to 86 or around there. So, to do that, you gotta either lower compression, and see that's that's getting rid of the knock, and then you can also raise cam profile a little bit. That doesn't really affect it too much. I'm going to lower the compression, 7.1 seems to fix it. Um, 250 pound-feet of torque, that's pretty good. I think the exhaust is restricting it a lot. Because you see how, you see this line that it created? That's not good. That means the exhaust is restricting it. And it looks like the engine parts can go up to 5800 RPM, so I'm going to do that. I'm actually going to leave it at 55 because it looks like it does not want to go much higher than that. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like that. And, um, 
Then I'm going to change the ignition timing just to have a little bit better, more power and a little better torque curve in my opinion. This is pretty good. It's peak torque pretty early. 2000 RPM and then keeps it until like, let's say about right here, at 4000 it kind of dies out a little bit but it's still got a lot of torque. And it starts at a thousand ish RPM with 190 torque, which is quite a bit for basically in the 1980s, it was quite a bit. <coughs> Exhaust, you can leave it single or dual, it doesn't really matter. You just have to tune the car accord accordingly. Now, let's see how the engine sounds. Sounds pretty nice. So yeah, that's a pretty good sounding car. Now, uh, now you pick the body of the car, which basically these are all the selections, and um, if you see here, it says 1985 sedan, 1985 wagon, 1985 coupe, you know, so on, so on. And um, if you're making like a sports car, definitely use the coupe because Otherwise, it just doesn't really make much sense, unless you're making like a Charger or something where it's four-door fast car. With this, then you can stretch the car, the body of the car, a little bit. It's got a little bit of freedom here, so it's pretty good. I'll be right back when I get this in the shape I want it to be in. All right, I think that'll do. Basically, it's just you can change the shape. I think this body is probably a little bit too more uh, too modern for 1986, but it's it's okay. We'll just have to deal deal with that. Now, uh, I'm just gonna paint it. Let's go with like a retro color. How about this blue? That blue looks nice on it. Oh, I'm gonna disable morphing. So you can change all the different colors of things and like make your car have like plastic bumpers, which was common on economy cars of the time. And you can change all the trim, make like have chrome trim or you know steel trim. But that that's not really realistic for this car, so I'm just gonna leave it as is. And it makes the wheels completely steel because I think there's like a little chrome lip that forms on them. If you like it, it, it presets to have a chrome lip for the little edge of the wheel. So I, I don't like that on the steel wheel design like this. So now I'm going to design the car and then come back. All right, so I'm back, and I just wanted to point a few things out. So, um, about door handles, you want to always have, like, for 60s cars, you want to have, like, push-button door handles in, like, 70s, then you want to start switching to a, uh, a design where it, it's sort of like a 
handle that you pull up, like this one, except um, you see the second one, you want to do that for like 70s and 80s cars, because they always had door handles where you could pull up like that. But I think this is going to be sort of like a, um, like a car that's a little bit higher end, so maybe these door handles fit it better, but they don't really, never mind. Yeah, these work really well on basically any sort of 80s car, and in the 90s they started switching to stuff like these, and early 2000s they would switch to like, they'd have door handles where you can pull on them, like, you know, like normal cars nowadays have. I'm going to continue designing my car, I'll be right back. Alright, so uh, I'm back and I've designed my car. So a few things to go over is that uh, you always want to have like a lot of detail. So what I've done is I've overlapped a few things. You always rem want to remember these buttons right here because like you can put things in front of other things. Like if I didn't have that button, it would look really weird like that. See, the grill would just become part of the headlight. This, now you can see that the grill and the headlight, like the headlight goes over the grill. So uh, with this, is not, uh, this design, it's sort of trying to emulate a uh, American semi-luxury sedan. Like, not super luxuries, but like not like a uh, family car either. So like a, uh, it's not a Cadillac or anything. And um, I also put the lettering in on the back. It's always useful to have. It's sort of a, uh, it's a sort of a muscle sedan, sort of like a Chrysler, like a 300C or something, except it's a little bit older. Now, a lot of the times, automation does not have the parts you want for your car. So, like these mirrors don't really fit the car exactly, but they're good enough that I don't really mind. Another thing you always want to like make sure you do is like with antennas and stuff. You want to make sure you have cardinal lock on or else it'll just sort of be at an angle. And then you have like a weird antenna that's facing forwards. But if you put cardinal lock on then it'll uh, straighten out so that way it goes straight up. Now for the drivetrain. I'm going to do a lot of little rear wheel drive because it's not super high tech and it's not a truck, so I don't understand why I would ever do anything different. In the mid 80s, it was like just about when they started putting advanced automatics in cars, like electronic automatics, and in uh, it's more of in the like 1990s when GM started putting electronic transmissions in their cars. But I'm going to put the, um, advanced automatic, which is pretty much an electronic gearbox, electronically controlled automatic instead of just a hydraulically one, hydraulically controlled one. Manual is the other option, and that's pretty good, but it's not uh, suitable for this application right here. Four speeds is pretty standard across the board in the 80s. A lot of cars were three speeds, but those were like budget cars that maybe had four cylinders. But you always want to set like your top speed high because, um, and like edit the spacing like this because otherwise you have a very 
poorly designed transmission. You'll see in a minute when it, the graphs come up and you tune the car. So differentials, I'm going to put a gear limited slip because I have a lot of torque in this car and that's not good with an open differential. Uh, cross ply tires were pretty much like completely stopped selling after radials were like all the flaws with radials were gotten rid of because it's such a better design that for a passenger car that it just didn't matter anymore. For a passenger sedan, hard and long life is probably like on the budget side of things, so medium compound seems good. As far as compounds for like, oh they changed that, that's cool. That was different before, like the texture for it. And semi-slicks are race cars. As far as compounds for like sports cars and you know, stuff like that, it's pretty self-explanatory. Medium is pretty good for this. Hard and long life is for like really cheap cars, like economy cars, and they, uh, I could see um, SUVs and trucks having those as standard. So for the tire width, 225 is good for the front and the rear. Normally you want to have it squared out, like 225, like both of them have them the same numbers, so that way you can take the rear tires, put them on the front in real life. I'm just going to edit that so that way it's also um, the right way because it, it wasn't sticking out far enough from the wheel well. It was sort of tucked in there really well. 15 inch rims were kind of the thing that was back then, so they, they normally didn't have anything larger than a uh, 15 inch, 16 inch rims in 1986 were like on high end cars. Um, we can put on alloy wheels. Aluminum wheels weren't too uncommon back then. <coughs> so, for this, um, for the brakes, you want to have probably two pistons in front. And then, oh, I need to edit that. It's not supposed to be that bright. There. Um, solid discs are what I use because vented discs, they've put, they've notched them. They, in this game, vented discs are more like a uh, drilled and slotted rotor when they're really just supposed to be on the edge here. On the edge of the rotor there's little holes, when solid disc there's not. So I, I tend to use just solid discs because it, it just doesn't really make sense to have like a, uh, a normal car with drilled and slotted rotors. Are the tire sizes different? No, they're not. That was weird. Alright, so I'll do 11 in the front, 10 in the rear. Uh, dual piston in the front, single piston in the rear, that's pretty standard. For the time period at least, and honestly today. We still use that a lot in today's cars. For pad type, I normally leave it at 50 unless it needs to be changed. But we'll worry about that later on, along with the brake bias. For the under tray, we don't want anything because this is like a skid plate. And uh, skid plates, so that way you don't puncture an oil pan. And this stuff is only on like race cars for 1980s and really only makes its way down to normal cars in mid 2000s, like 2013-ish cars maybe had them for fuel economy purposes. Cooling airflow, we can change that to maybe 65. Brake airflow, I normally change to like 5 or 10 just to have that there. The seats, I could put in bench seats and a standard interior. It's pretty standard for the kind of car I'm trying to build, so why not? In the 80s it was it was normal to have that. Standard HVAC makes sense. Um, yeah, I wouldn't I would put a cassette in in the uh, higher end variants of it because this is the base trim level. Power steering hydraulic is like when they first started having that in the 60s and 70s. Variable hydraulic was uh, in the 80s, they definitely did that to improve cars. Uh, ABS was not mandatory at the time, so we'll make that optional and have that on a higher trim level. 
Uh, safety, we'll have a standard 80s because that would make sense for this kind of car. And we're not going to mess with the quality sliders at all. Uh, the springs, standard springs are good, and so are twin tube dampers. I don't know why there's really a need for anything else. And it seems to be good, it just needs to be tuned now. So I'll get to tuning and then come right back. Alright, so I'm done with tuning, and uh, I think that this game does not really like uh, bench seats too much. Because you see, if I do that, it just immediately makes everything more green. But it's a base model, and I'm going to stick by it. So uh, first things first, I set top speed pretty high for most games, or, or for most builds in automation, people don't set that too high, they just set it at like 120, and uh, no overdrive, so on the highway, my car on the highway, let's see, uh, detail stats, my car on the highway will set it a little bit under 2500 RPM, which is pretty good for fuel economy. My car gets combined 11.6, which is very good for a V8, in this game at least. In real life, it would probably get higher numbers than that. So, the gearbox, if you have this spacing, like, if I set it like this, it basically means the gears are, like, closer together. But if I just set it like that, then it basically means that I can have uh, short gearing and have good 0 to 60 of 7.6. I can actually lower that a little bit. And make it so that way it doesn't spin the tires as much. Let's see. If I just keep on lowering it. Alright, that's when the game's happy. But, uh, I'm gonna make it so 8 seconds 0 to 60. There. Oh, let's go one under 8 seconds. There, 7.9. 7.9 seconds is good 0 to 60. And um, the car will still have an overdrive gear. So you still have a fast car, but it allows it to just sit at low RPMs on the highway, which a lot of people don't let the car do. And um, the brakes were pretty much good where they were. The tires, I already showed that. But the brakes, all I needed to do was, um, actually not much, I just needed to change that, like, two things. Like, it was just like that before. I just needed to change it up to this is perfectly fine. Doesn't matter. This is perfectly fine. It would be much better with a front two-seat and the rear two-seat. But the rear two-seat's not realistic. The front two-seat wouldn't really be on the base model. And, um... This doesn't need to be touched. Suspension, I just typically tune it so that way it it's sort of like a more comfortable comfortable car. So I sort of tune it between comfortable uh, being comfortable and drivable. And the huge thing you gotta watch out for is that they set these sway bars to like two thousand and like twenty five hundred, and that that's not okay. Like the car needs a little bit of roll angle. Honestly, this still has too much roll angle. In my opinion, the car needs to be able to body roll so that way it can um, not lose grip and have a little bit of pliability in the suspension. And in real life, cars do body roll quite a bit more than like uh, like people expect, I guess. And uh, they just leave them at two thousand. That's like race car, like huge sway bars that wouldn't make any sense in a real life application. So I, I changed that so now it gets 7.5 degrees of roll angle, which is good. So um, this is a uh, stats page.
I guess. Oh no, uh, this is like the design page where you can look at your car. And this is the markets thing, and you can see how car, uh, how well your car will sell. And this is sort of all the different stats and how your car is being affected by each thing. Like, you can see if, um, for sportiness, uh, how, like, each of your decisions on building the car, how they affect the final design, and how it would affect the sportiness of the car. And the gearbox, being an automatic, definitely harms the sportiness of this car. Then there's the test track where you can run around the test track. I'm not going to do that because, I mean, that that's kind of... I can do that in BeamNG, and I will do that in BeamNG in a minute. And then here's the exporter page. And, uh... Alright. I'm exporting my car, so I can drive in BMNG and then I'm going to see how it does.